right, welcome back. So, it's the first day of week five, and we're going to talk about something new today. And this is a topic that's going to occupy us for the next few weeks, so to the next big you know, unit in the class. So we're done talking about imperative programming. You guys know how to do that now, or at least you know enough about how to do it for us to keep practicing for the rest of the semester, which is really what's going to happen. But today, what we're going to do is we're going to start talking about Java objects. This is a central feature of the Java programming language, and it's a feature that's shared by many other programming languages as well. It also dramatically expands our ability to work with data, which is extremely exciting. And we're going to look at some examples of how to do that today. So what, you know, just looking ahead throughout the rest of the semester, here's the things that we're going to work on. So we're going to continue talking about algorithms, how to use computers to solve problems. And one of the cool things about objects in Java is they bring together data and algorithms. So two of the core concerns of computer science united together in this single um, entity, this single abstraction that we're going to start learning about. So we will continue to talk about algorithms. We'll do a little more of that in the last third of the class. But Java objects do bring together data and algorithms in a very natural way. And we'll see that in a sec. So data structures, how do we structure data? Um, and particularly, both how do we structure data so that we can write algorithms that solve problems efficiently, but also how do we structure data uh, so that we can work with more kinds of data in a natural way. And again, we'll see some examples of that today. And then finally, you know, we're going to keep giving you guys a lot of practice with software development. So how do we write, you know, test and debug good pieces of software? And mainly, you know, something you guys will be learning uh, as we continue on through the MPs throughout the rest of the semester, but we may talk about this in class a little bit as well. So this is sort of a blueprint. This is our plan for the next 11 weeks, right? The next, you know, roughly two-thirds of this semester. Okay, so today. So really what we're starting to talk about, we, we talked about this a little bit when we talked about functions. But this is, you know, how do we structure our, you know, good computer programs? Um, we... We've already looked a little bit about how to break our code into smaller pieces. So we've looked at how to write functions, right? A function is a single piece of reusable logic that I can then use to solve the same problem over and over again whenever that problem reappears in my code. So we've seen how to do this. This was good. Um, what we're going to start talking about today is bringing together state and behavior. So bringing together data with the algorithms that operate on data. So data, you know, an algorithm typically takes data as input. And what Java objects allow us to do is to sort of unite data with the natural set of methods and algorithms that operate on it, right? Bring those two together into one entity that can then be passed around and, and make sure that whenever I have access to a particular piece of data, I also now have access to useful algorithms and methods that operate on that information. You've already seen that a little bit with strings. So strings were our first example of an object. A string not only contained data, a sequence of characters internally, but it has all these useful features. You can split it. You can, you know, uh, find a substring. You can search it for various things, right? It, it provides all of these useful methods. These are really, these methods are really implementing small little algorithms, but they're algorithms and methods that are natural to run on that kind of data. So again, we've seen this already, but today we're going to start looking at how we can do this ourselves, how we can build our own classes and methods. We'll continue, you know, talking about documentation um, and how to reuse pre-existing solutions, but really our focus uh, in this part of the class is on combining state and behavior. So that's the new thing that we're going to introduce today. This, you know, I, I just want to bring us back and remind you uh, about what you're doing and the kind of things you're learning. So this is one of the places now where we actually get to stretch our design muscles a little bit. You know, programming, you know, up until now, you know, maybe uh, we've been exercising more of the left brain side of programming, the, the problem solving, you know, algorithm development. That's a little bit of the sort of left brain pieces. Once we start talking about objects and how to design our own data structures and how to design our own classes to store information, now we're going to start to reactivate that right brain part of programming, the creative part, the part that's you know, thinking about how is another person going to react to my program, which may be correct, 
but you know, how is someone else going to use this? Is someone else going to like it? Does it seem natural? Does it seem beautiful? Right? Because that, that is a thing when we talk about code, when we talk about uh, programs. There is a, such a thing as beauty in computer science. I've seen it from time to time. Sometimes I might even claim to create it myself, but that's on good days. Um, so Java objects start to expose you to this part of computer science, because what we're really going to start doing is we start giving you guys a chance to think about how to create your own classes, your own types. So up until this point, we've talked about these primitive types that are built into Java, the seven primitive types that allow us to work with various types of numbers, essentially, some of them with or without decimals, and then other things that we don't talk about like numbers, but really are numbers internally, like characters or Boolean values, whatever. But now you can actually create your own types. The Java t we're going to open up the Java type system for you and allow you to start to actually say, hey, you know, I have some data I want to represent. There's no Java type to do this. Let's create my own. Right? That's, that's a kind of an exciting thing to be able to do. So ahead of us, you know, there's no, we're getting to the point in the class, particularly when we start to talk about object modeling, where what we're doing is design. There are no right or wrong answers here. Um, this is something that's, you know, I will, I will confess it's hard to teach in this class because of how many of you there are and the fact that we have to have these test suites that work in a cer certain way or whatever. Uh, but when you guys start working with the Java type system, I want you to feel like this is something that you own, right? And you can approach these problems, you know, with creativity, you know, imagination, all of these sort of like very right brain attributes, right? Thinking about how this fits into a broader system, um, using your intuition to think about, okay, how is this particular type of data going to be used? Um, this is sort of where, where we're going now, right? And this is, a, this is a fun place to get to. This is an exciting part of the class. All right, so what is a Java object? Java objects, and I'm going to say this over and over again, you get tired of hearing it, but they bring together state and behavior. Um, you can also think of them as kind of something that's starting to merge together some of the features that we've associated with variables, which we've used to store information, and functions, which we've used to process information or to perform transformations on data. Um, so objects sort of, when we think about objects, we're going to talk about two things. The first thing is, what data does the object store? So what information is, is, is it storing? And again, objects allow us to unlock the Java type system and begin to use it to our advantage. We're going to see an example of this in a minute, and we're going to see an example that comes out of a very ugly, unnatural way that you were forced to work with data in MP0, which you might have seen and been like, oh, this is sort of awful. Isn't there a better way to do this? There is a better way to do it. We're about to talk about it. So when we talk about objects, we'll talk about what information is it storing. Because when we create our own types in Java, we're doing that to store data. That's why. There's, there's no other reason. If you can store the data that you need to work with using one of Java's existing primitive types, then go for it. Or in a string, then go for it. But there's a lot of times when we can't do that. There's a lot of data that's more interesting than that. And Java objects give us a chance to, to store new kinds of data. And then when we talk about objects, we're also going to talk about what does it do? So state and behavior. State data, storing information, behavior. Algorithms, functions, methods. An object in Java carries along with it not just information, but also capabilities. It can do stuff. Those strings that you've been working with. Again, a string knows how to do a bunch of useful things. And those things are all kind of a function of the fact that it stores a particular type of data. So, you know, it wouldn't, some of the string methods wouldn't make sense to implement on another class. And there's a lot of methods that you would implement on a certain class because of the kind of data it stores that wouldn't make sense to implement on a string. So there's always this really tight connection between these two things. The kind of data that an object stores determines the type of methods that we want to add and provide. Those methods should be useful for working with the kind of data that that object is encapsulated or storing in turn. And we'll see some examples of this as we go. So again, this is what's sort of fun about objects, and this is why they're, they're, it's, it's a feature that's present in you know, most, if not all, modern programming languages. Python has objects, JavaScript has objects, you know, uh, C, C++ has objects, you know, Ruby probably has objects. I mean, you know, most modern programming languages, they don't all do it the same way as Java. 
Java has you know, a particular set of rules and structure surrounding objects that not every programming language has chosen to copy. But the idea of objects is extremely powerful, and that's why you see it pop up all over the place. And you know, again, it brings together these two core concerns of computer science. Data, working with data, being able to do stuff with the information we find throughout the world, and the algorithms, the actual ways that we, we process that information. All right, so you know, the, the formal definition from Wikipedia is a, this is a class-based object-oriented programming paradigm. Object refers to a particular instance of a class where an object can be a combination of variables, functions, and data structures. So, you know, functions and information. So, let's start talking about, let's start looking at uh, some of our terminology surrounding objects. So now we're gonna talk about Java syntax. But this is another case where an object or a class is really a concept. Here's how we do it in Java. If I was teaching Python or JavaScript, this would look different. But the idea of an object is something that spans multiple programming languages, but here is some of the syntax that we start to see in Java. You guys have seen some of this already because it's impossible to work in Java without seeing some of the syntax. So for example, the MPs that you're working on, you may have had to type this out and not been exactly sure what you were doing, so now we're gonna talk about it. That's an unfortunate feature of, of, of Java in the sense that it's quite strict about this. And so everything has to be you know, an object in Java. But now we're gonna start looking at, at the syntax. So this is a class uh, declaration in Java. You'll see the word class on line one. That's a reserved word in Java, sort of like you know, int or a type or while or if or whatever. And the next thing that follows class is a name. Person, and then I have um, an open block. What's inside that block is the blueprint that determines how this particular object is going to behave. What it's going to store, the data that's, that's going to live inside this object, and then also the functions or methods that this object is going to provide. So, on line two, so I have my class definition, I'm calling this class person. I can call the class anything I want, but usually it's good to pick a name that's sort of uh, indicative of what this class is doing, what type of data it's storing, what it's allowing me uh, to, to model. So, if I have, for example, strings, right? String stores a uh, you know, sequence of characters. On line two, I have something that looks a little bit like a variable declaration that I would see in a function, but it's not inside a function. It's inside the class. This, what this is saying is that every instance of a person has a name. That name is of type string. So now I'm starting to tell Java, hey, I'm creating this new type. That's actually what I'm doing. I'm declaring a new type. I'm declaring a new class. That class is going to, one of the pieces of data that class is going to store is a name. That name is of type string. So every person will have a name, and that name will be a Java string type. In my little example here, every person also has an age which I'm storing as an int. It could store it as a double, that might be more accurate, uh, but for this example, we use an int. So now what I've done, you know, before I did this, there would be no way to store these two pieces of information together. Java can store them separately. I know how to work with strings, and I know how to work with ints. But now I'm bringing them together, because I'm saying, I wanna start to work with person objects. And I've decided, that some of the attributes that every person has is a name and an age. Now, you may disagree with me about this. Um, maybe, you know, not you don't think everybody has a name, or maybe, probably, you think there's more stuff that should be up here, and that's okay. This is just a small example. I'm not saying that this is the right class to represent a person, but it has some of the information that we might want to store about a person, depending on the program that we were writing. All right, so I've got you know, two variables. These are called class variables, or instance variables, that I've declared on lines two and three. And then on line four, I have a function declaration and definition. So I have a function that re returns void, so it, is, it doesn't need to return anything. It's called print name. It takes no arguments. And then I open up a block, and I've got the body of my function. On the MPs that you have done, you've seen this. You haven't seen it on every homework problem. You're gonna to start to see it now because we've hidden it from you. 
When we, you guys have submitted your homework problems, what we've actually had to do is take the function that you wrote and kind of stick it into a little class that we have hanging around waiting for, for you to write a method for it. But now at this point, we're going to zoom out a little bit. You're going to start to see more of the syntax that surrounds this because every function in Java has to exist inside some class. I can't just have a function hanging out. It always has to be inside of a class. So what I'm saying here is that every person has a function called print name. So now I'm talking about what instances of this class can do. State and behavior. Data and algorithm. So the data here, every person has a name that's of type string and an age that's of type int. And algorithms. Every person can print their name to the console if I call this print name function. Questions about this? One of the, one of the things, just, just let me, I'll take that one in a minute. Um, one of the things we'll talk about next time, or I think maybe on Friday, um, there's a bunch of keywords that you guys are probably used to seeing in here, like public, private, static. We will talk about all of those. Just give me some time. Um, throwing them up there right now isn't super useful, and I want to zero in on exactly what we're doing. Uh, but we will get there. We will talk about all those. Those are called visibility modifiers. They're very important. Um, but right now, they're just kind of in the way um, in terms of talking about exactly what we want to talk about. Yeah, question. So person is a type of Java object. That's a great question. So a class, yeah, I should read the rest of my slide. Um, the, the class in Java is a blueprint that determines how a particular type of object is going to behave. So when you uh, declare a class, you're telling Java, I want to be able, you know, again, this is sort of unlocking Java's type system. So you're saying, hey, you know what? I've got some data that I can't represent just as an int or as a string or as a long or as an array of ints or strings or longs. I want to create this new type. And so I'm declaring that a person, I have declared this new type. Notice something about person um, that, remember, remember the, our rules for names in Java? The primitive types start with what kind of character? Lowercase. Java objects always start with uppercase. Yeah, so person up there um, is a new type of object, and so that name is capitalized. So the class is a blueprint. At this point, there are no actual objects of type person in my system. I'm just telling Java how to create one and what it means for an object to be a person. It means that it has to have a name. It means that it has to have an age. And it means that it's going to have this method called print name. In a minute, I'll show you actually how to create an instance of this class, or an instance, or sometimes we refer to that as an object, an instance of this class. But for now, what I'm doing is providing instructions to Java so that it understands what a person is. A person has a name and an age, and has this, this function. Great question. Other questions? Okay, so this is sort of, you know, a good analogy is that a class is sort of like a blueprint. You know, a blueprint says, here's how to build something. For example, here's how to build a particular kind of house. It's not the house. I still have to go build the thing. Um, but it tells Java how to, how to, certain things about how to construct a person. All right. So I think I just said all this. So, so every instance of this particular class is going to have a name that's of type string, an age that's of type int, and we'll have a method available to it called print name. So Java has this restriction, which is that um, once you've compiled your program, you can't change the definition of classes as the program runs. So remember last time, or you know, last week we talked about compilation was that step where the Java compiler takes your source code and turns it into Java bytecode, which is then executed. After you compile your code, I can't make changes to a person. So if later as the program is running, I'm like, oh, every person should also have like a weight or a birthday or something like that, I can't add that later. It has to be part of the class definition when the code is compiled. Um, on some level, this is like a little bit of extra flexibility that's missing from Java. And if you use other programming languages that allow you to do this, you may find this frustrating. Um, but the reality is when you're building large pieces of software that really have to work, this is actually kind of the right thing to do. It forces you to make these choices as you're designing and compiling your program. 
Okay. So, an instance. So, so now we have this distinction. My class is the blueprint. The blueprint is not an object. The blueprint is just something that tells Java how to create an instance of that type. Now if I want to actually create my first person, I use this new keyword. So now, again, now we're starting to pull some things forward. We've seen new before. We saw it when we created arrays. We saw it in one way to create strings. That's what new is for in Java. New creates a new instance of an object from a class definition. So now I've got this piece of code on line eight that's really important to understand. So I've got my definition of a person from lines one through seven. I've told Java what a person is. And then on line eight, I have a variable declaration and initialization. So Jeffrey is an, is an instance of a person. So that's the type over here. This is the name of the variable. And then on the right side, I have new and the name of the class, followed by an open and closed parentheses. Now, what does that look like over on the right? So I've got my new keyword, I have the name of my type, and then it's, this sort of looks like what? What does this syntax remind you of? Where do I normally see like open and close parentheses, sometimes with some stuff in between? Yeah. When I'm calling a function. So it turns out I am calling a function here, and we'll talk about that next time. There's a function that runs when the object is created. I'm not gonna talk about that today, we'll talk about that on Wednesday. Um, but that's why those parentheses are there. And it's also possible for me to pass information to that function, and we'll see examples of how to do that next time. After line eight executes, my variable Jeffrey now has what we call a reference to an object of type person. So in this little piece of code, I've defined a new type in Java's type system, which is pretty cool, and I've created an object of that type. So Jeffrey has, at this point, a name and an age. Now, you might wonder what is Jeffrey's name and age at this point, because I haven't set those, so we'll see how to do that in a second. So person, I want to make this distinction. This is an important distinction to understand. Person is a class. It's a type of object. So person is sort of like int or long. It's a type. It's a custom type that we've created here to represent a particular type of information. It's not built into Java, so we had to tell Java how to create it. Strings aren't also built into Java. Strings are defined in exactly the same way. There is code somewhere in Java that looks very much like this for a string, where it has like an array of characters, and then it has a bunch of methods that the string provides that you guys have been using. Person with a capital P is a class, so that's a new type in Java. It's not an object. Jeffrey is an instance of type person. So we refer to person as a class. Jeffrey is either an instance of the class or sometimes just an object. This is an important distinction to understand. So this is sort of like if I declare a variable of type int called foo, int is a type. Foo is the variable. In this class, person is the type. Jeffrey is the variable. Jeffrey is an object. Questions about this? This is important to understand. The reason why we're seeing all of this for the first time is because for the first time in Java, we're actually defining our own types. So we're actually, we're not using the built-in types or strings, which are also sort of built in. Um, we're defining our own types at Java. So we're actually starting to, to be able to use this feature of Java to structure data more effectively. Once I have an instance of an object, I can use dot notation to access its properties, its data, and its methods. So you guys have been doing this when you work with strings. You've been using dot notation to call string.length, or string.trim, or string.split, or whatever. And I can do the same thing here. I can also use dot notation to access the uh, properties, or the data, stored inside the object. So on line eight, what I've done is I've created a new instance of person called Jeffrey, using the new keyword. And then on line nine, I'm setting the, the age of that object to 38, which is wrong. It should be 39. Slides are old. Um, 
And then I'm going to print that. So I can set and get this variable just like it was a local variable. See, we'll see. Okay, so let's let's do an example with this because this is important to to work around with. Um, so you'll see. Let's correct this to print my actual age. One thing I want to point out here. Um, is that each person has its own age. What do you think the so so. So how have I changed this? So I've created a new person instance on line 9 called student. And then I'm going to print off the age of student on line 12. But I haven't set the age of student. What do you think the age of student is? What's the default value for an uninitialized integer in an object? What do you guys think? It's not null, because integers can't be null. Instead, it's 0. Yeah. So if I print this off. You're going to see that the uh, initial value for students' age is zero. So this is the thing that frequently trips people up when they start working with objects, is that every one of them has its own state. So you'll see here that I've created two different instances of person. When I change the age of one, it doesn't change the age of other, of the other, right? So I set my age to 39. I'll set your age. To 19, it's probably pretty accurate. Um, is that true? How many people in here are 19? Oh lord, it's really young. Um, okay, there you go. I am now over twice your age. Um, I guess I was going to pass that milestone at some point. Uh, I just didn't realize it was going to be this year. Um, so I've got two separate person instances. When I change one, I don't change the other. Make sense? You guys will get the hang of this. Okay, questions about this? Yeah. So the question is, okay, let's 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 play with the name here. Let's say Jeffrey.name is equal to Jeffrey. Um, and down here I'm gonna print my name. I'm gonna print student's name. Okay, so. This is good, good practice, actually. The default value for an uninitialized object in Java is no. So the print statements down here now, my name is Jeffrey, your name is null. Sorry. Um, no offense. I just we haven't got around to setting your name yet. Um, but yeah, so because I haven't initialized that string variable yet, it prints as null. Good question. All right. So instance variables. Um, so here's, here's a couple of other examples here. So here on line one, I've got the declaration of a class, a new type in Java that stores dimensions. So and this could be dimensions of a piece of furniture. It could be the dimensions of a room. It could be the dimensions of you know, a book or whatever. Um, it's got a width and a height. A lot of things have you know, two dimensions and you know a width and a height in 2D. That class is constructed from primitive types. So the instance variables that you uh, define, the, the data stored in your class can be uh, primitive types in Java in this case. So dimensions is constructed of two primitive types, a width and a height that are both ints. But I can also build classes from other objects. So for example, my room class now has both a name, you know, like living room, dining room, or whatever. A name is an object, and it also has a dimensions. Dimensions is also an object. So I can create objects out of other objects. So my classes in Java can uh, represent data both using primitive types or by using, you know, combinations of other types that you've already provided. And so one of the things that you'll frequently do when you start a large project in Java is yet you'll give some thought when you start out about how to represent the various kinds of data that you need to work with in that project. So my instance variables can either be primitive types or other Java objects. Now, when I create an object that contains other objects, 
initially, those other objects are not initialized. So this is important to understand. And we'll talk more about this and what to do about it on Wednesday. So on line nine, I'm creating a new instance of class, the type room. I'm calling that variable dining room. If I print off dimensions at this point, what is that going to print? Anybody want to take a guess? It's null, because I haven't initialized it yet. So if I try to just set the width of my dining room, I have this null pointer exception because I haven't actually created the object that is stored inside the room. And so for this little example, I'm going to do this as follows, which is that I'm actually going to, and this, I can do this, I'm going to say dining room dot dimensions, so that's a dimensions object, and I'm going to initialize it to be a new instance of the dimensions class. Then I can do things like set its width and height, and get them as well. So I can do... That'll work. This, so, so this might look like a huge, start to look like a huge pain, right? Like every time I create a Java object, do I have to do all this extra setup? And how do I even know what to do? The answer is no. And we'll come back and talk about this on Wednesday when we talk about these special functions that run when the object is created. Because typically those special functions will do this type of initialization for you. So you won't have to do this yourself, right? So again, this is now looking like a lot of code just to create like a pretty simple uh, instance of this class. But again, we talk about constructors, we'll see how the room class then becomes responsible for setting up any of its instance variables that you might need to work with. Okay. So again, I want to come back to this because I think this is really important and it's a great way for us to connect objects with data which is one of the exciting things about computer science, is the ability to work with data. So I was, ta I was talking to someone last week, and I feel like you, you guys are in a great spot, because one of, you know, one of the, the things that is holding us back from solving a lot of problems in the world today is data. We don't have it. We don't have enough data about all sorts of different things. And some of that data we can't just go and collect really easily. We have to wait. It takes time, decades. Think about diseases. Think about various types of medical stuff. You have to collect data about that stuff for years and years and years and years before you can actually start to process it and figure out what to do. So by the time we actually start to have some of that data available, you know who's going to be ready to use it? You, if you guys learn how to do this. I'll be too old by then, right? You know, and plus, I'll still be doing this. But, um, but yeah, I mean, but we are, like, we're on the cusp of, I think, a real revolution in this area. All this stuff you've heard about big data, I mean, it's way too early. We just don't have the data sets we need, but we're starting to collect them now because it's, people are realizing, wait, you know, this is important. We have all this computing power. We have these incredibly cool algorithms to use. What we don't have is data. And so we're, I think in certain places, again, people are starting to realize this, but it doesn't happen overnight. It's not like AlphaGo. It can just play millions of games all by itself. You know, when things happen in the world, it takes a long time for us to actually gather information about it. Again, think about our measurements of the climate, right? Those only really started, like, you know, maybe 100 years ago, and really only started really accurately, you know, maybe a few decades ago. It's going to take us a long time to gather enough data to really understand certain things that happen in the world or to our own bodies. So the, the ability to define custom types in Java dramatically makes it more um, easy and possible to work with data that we find in the world. So I have set this up extremely carefully. You know, when we were writing MP0, I was like, I know what we're going to do later, so we're going to come back and talk about it. You remember this? Remember, you know, uh, farthest north? Maybe you've blocked it out. Maybe therapy has helped or whatever, but maybe we've forgotten about this. Um, but, like, this is awful. How many of you saw this and were like, what is going on here? I've got an array of latitudes, an array of longitudes, an array of valid locations. And what's linking them all together is this index. It's just stupid. You know, this is wrong. This is not the right way to solve the problem. The reason why you did it this way is because we hadn't had this conversation yet. But now we've had this conversation. 
And so, look, synchronized indices is broken. Don't ever do this. I'm sorry that you guys had to work through this. I mean, it was a fun way to kind of do some cool stuff on MP0, but it's fundamentally the wrong way to approach this. What do we actually want here? I don't want to have one array of latitudes and one array of longitudes and one array of, of whether or not the location is valid. How do I represent this better using a custom type? Yeah. Indeed. What I want is I want one location type that stores a latitude, a longitude, and in this case, whether or not that location fix is valid or not. You can think of all sorts of other information to put in here, too. What's another piece of data that every single location should also have? Every single location. Ah, you guys are so naive. You think these are accurate? What should every piece of location, every computer generated location should also have a what? Altitude. Oh, you could do altitude, that would be helpful. Yeah. Be more skeptical. Yeah. Margin of error. Accuracy. Even, you know, even really good GPS isn't accurate down to like centimeters, and particularly when you're indoors, it can be way off, right? So accuracy, you could put all sorts of other things in here. So here's how this should look, because now we can do this. Look at that. That is the right way to solve this problem. I'm telling Java, hey, I've got this type I want to work with, this piece of data that fundamentally brings together a couple of different things. Every position fix has latitude, longitude, and altitude, if I can compute it sometimes. It depends on where I get the, the location from. And then I have this is valid flag that I've created for, to solve this problem, right? And now my farthest north method can just take an array of these type of object. So now this is so much more natural. You know, again, rather than like, you know, oh, well, if the indice is the same, then they're from the same data point. I mean, no, no, that's, that's, that's dumb, right? This is the right way to do this. Okay. So this, that capability of objects is sometimes associated with an older data structure called records. But what's cool about objects is that I can also define behaviors. So we've talked at this point primarily about the data modeling part of objects. But let's also talk about methods, things that an object can do. Again, these methods, we want to connect really directly with the data that an object stores. Don't just throw a method up here that does some random thing. The methods are connected with the data the object stores. And the methods are typically intended to, to do things that someone who's using that data might want to do. So for example, my dimensions class has a width and a height. What's a natural thing to compute about this information? The area. So now I'm defining, an, what's this called, an instance method. The method has a name called area. And it, return, it has a return type called int. But there's something new about this. What's missing from the method declaration? You guys have written this method already. You guys have written like, or maybe it was called multiply or something, right? But what's missing here? What's different? Yeah. Yeah, there's no inputs. What's going on? The area, this area method somehow magically takes no inputs. So this is new. The reason why I don't need to provide the area with any inputs is that when an instance method runs, it has access to the data that's stored in the instance of the class. So I don't need to tell the area method that's defined on my dimensions class what the width and height are. It knows. It can look them up itself for that specific instance. So this is actually going to do the right thing. It's going to take this dot width, and we'll talk about this in a second, and multiply it by this dot height. My width, the width of this instance of this class, this dimensions class, times my height, the height of this instance of this dimensions class. So down at the bottom, I've got an example where I create a instance of the dimensions class called example. I set its width and height to 20 and 10, and then I call area. And what area is going to do 
is again, it, I don't need to tell it what width and height are. It knows that because I'm calling it on example. So when I run area on example, it looks up the width and height that have been set on that instance of the class and uses them in its calculation. And indeed, this will work. It's pretty cool. Let me, I, I want to keep reinforcing this, so let me do another example here where we do dimensions, another example, this new dimensions, and then we set, we set the width and height, ugh, typing is tough today, I'm still struggling, uh, width is equal to 20, and then do another example, dot height is equal to 40. So if I print example dot area, I get 200 because example, I've set the width and height of example to be 10 and 20. If I change this to print another example dot area, then I get 800 because there I've set the width and height to be 20 and 40. So every instance of my dimensions class carries around with it its own width and height. It also carries around with it now the ability to compute its area. So this is, again, this is, this is important to understand. So I've got sort of like all the pieces of, of what we wanted to talk about today up here. I've got a class definition that says, you know, this is a particular type of new, this is a new type that I'm declaring in Java called dimensions. It's got a width and a height. But, you know, the exciting thing about Java objects is that not only can I use them to structure data, but I can also start to define useful methods that operate on that data. So in this case, an area is a useful method. Um, you know, I could, I could write methods to compute whether or not the item was wider than it was long or longer than it was wide. Um, you know, I could write a method to, to figure out whether or not the, this particular, um, something of this size would fit into a certain size box, right? I mean, there's lots of different uh, way, you know, additional methods you can imagine adding here. All right, so let's talk this. Let's talk about this. So what is this? So this is, again, a special keyword in Java that always refers to the current object, the current instance of the object that's running this particular method. So whenever area runs, this dot width is the width of the instance that's running area. So let's go back to our previous example. When I call another example dot area, this code starts to run. And this, at that point, really refer refers to other example. This other example. So what I'm really doing is I'm essentially, you know, multiplying other example dot width with another example dot height. If I change that to be example dot area, then this refers to example. And so the width and height I get are different. Now, I don't need to use the this keyword. Did I put that in there? Nope. Um, okay, well, I've got another example here. Okay, so that's good. If I take this off, this will still work. I just want to point that out because you may see this places. To be honest, it's a little bit cleaner this way. Um, so if I run this, I'm going to get the same results. Why? Because when Java starts executing that function, so now we have to talk a little bit about how names work again in Java. Normally, if you saw something like this, up until this point, you would say, well, wait, width and height aren't defined in the function, so how can I use those variables? But in a class, and every function in Java lives inside a class, what Java will do is it'll say, okay, I'm trying to compile area. This actually happens when you compile your code. So it says, okay, the function is using a name called width. Is that name defined in the function or not? Is, this, is width defined as a local variable to this function? No, function doesn't define any local variables. Is width defined as a parameter to this function? No, function doesn't take any parameters. This is good practice for the midterm. Um, so if the variable isn't defined as a local variable or as a parameter to the, or an argument to the function, the next place the compiler will look is inside the class declaration. So then the compiler will say, does, you know, 
dimensions define a class variable, an instance variable called width? And in this case, the answer is yes. And so that's what gets used. Same, same thing happens for height. We'll come back and talk about this in, in a later lecture. So again, you know, the, the, the goal of using Java objects is really to allow us to model, you know, lots of different types of data, right? So we've seen examples today of, you know, a person where I can start to take attributes that are associated with a particular person and merge them together into a single type. We've also seen that example with latitude and longitude, right, which is, which is really doing the same thing. Um, this is, you know, part of what's so exciting about objects and something that we'll try to really emphasize going forward. All right, I'm gonna finish up a little bit early today. Um, I just wanna remind you, midterm starts tomorrow. So here's the format again. 12 multiple choice questions, mainly on code reading. There's not like the little, little dinky ones. Um, there'll be three programming questions. There's a, pro there's a programming question on single dimensional arrays. There's a programming question on multi-dimensional arrays. And there is a programming question on strings. All three of those questions will have small partial credit opportunities, um, you know, like a, a couple of smaller tests that we run before we run our, our full test suite, you can get a few points on. Um, as a reminder, one of those problems, I'm not gonna say which one, is gonna be lifted directly from the homework. It'll be a homework problem that is on that homework 125 problem set. Maybe the encrypt one or something like that. No, it's too hard. Um, everything that we've done this semester at this point is up on that problem set. That's all of the previous quiz questions, all of the lab homework and problems, all of the daily homework problems, it's all up there. So this is how to prepare. If you can do all the problems on that homework problem set, and you can do them you know, without you know, getting a lot of help from a CA or a lot, without looking up a bunch of stuff on the internet, uh, without making a bunch of mistakes that take you hours to fix, you're ready. Like you will, you will do fine on the midterm. All right, any questions about the midterm exam before we wrap up for the day? Okay, great. Um, the MB1 early deadline is today at 5 p.m. As a, I, I should have posted this on the forum. I dropped the, um, the threshold to 40 points. So you need 40 points to get the early deadline as opposed to 50. Um, midterm starts tomorrow. My office hours today are gonna be three to five in the basement. So I'll be down helping people finish up the early deadline on MP1. Good luck on the midterm, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Oh, reminder, there's no lab this week. We will hold office hours during lab time to help you guys prepare for the midterm.